Okay, hi everybody. I see we've got a bunch of people joining us. Thank you for waiting. We just had a slight delay today. I'm gonna give a chance for everybody to get into the room. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. I know many of you have been with us before, so you know the drill. But what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is, you know, find the chat box and introduce yourselves. Let us know who's here, who's joining us today. I'm also gonna pop into the chat the link for the closed captioning today. So if you need the closed captioning services, you can just click on the link that I just put into the chat box. So welcome, Lily. I wanna see who else is joining us today. Alex, nice to have you guys back. Corey, you too, and Sage. Oh yes, I am so Tyra, this is our, our regulars. I know all of these names. They've been with us most of the summer. So nice. They, well, uh, welcome. Yeah, so I know and I recognize a couple of new names joining us today. So everybody just go ahead, introduce yourselves in the chat. I'm going to just remind you of what our protocols we follow when we're here in our Zoom meetings. All of you are muted today. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't engage with our presenter. So we have a couple of ways that you can do that. We use the chat box for you to answer any questions our presenter has, or if they're asking for your thoughts on something, or maybe uh, you want to share something that you know about the topic with others in the group. That's what our chat is for. When you have a question for our presenter, we have a Q&A box, and that's specifically for questions that you have of our presenter today. Others can go and look at the questions being asked. If you like someone's questions, there's a thumbs up that you can just click on. And what that does, it's called upvoting and it moves the question up the ranking. But don't worry, we make sure to answer everyone's question and all questions are welcome. Everybody comes at this from a different perspective. So whatever questions pop into your mind, do not be shy about asking them. You also have the ability to ask your questions anonymously. So there really should be no pressure. If something is in your mind that you want to ask, go ahead and ask that. We just ask that you be courteous um, and respectful today to one another and try not to create any distractions. It's kind of hard in this format. We can't see you, so you only see myself and our presenter on video. But really sometimes where the distraction comes in is with the chat box. So again, just please make sure to use it appropriately, stay on topic, stay engaged and participate fully. Um, I wanna back up for a second for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lauren Traster. I am the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator for UVM Extension. And one of the programs that I run are these science cafes. They used to be in person before we had uh, restrictions due to coronavirus. And so we've started doing the virtual cafes. Um, we started back in March. And I do want to let you know that we, you know, so we started back in March and then we created this summer series. We have two more sessions with, within our summer series. So next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. And really good topics. One's on pollinators and the other's on backyard poultry and talking about salmonella. There's a professor at UVM that does research on this. So I really encourage you guys to stay with us for our final two sessions. And I am planning to continue these in the fall. We'll probably take a, a, a few, uh, maybe a couple week break. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what school schedules are gonna look like. And once I can figure out where to offer these and, and pay attention, because I will be sending out a survey to get your feedback of the best time to offer these in the fall. But we'll continue and we'll still have uh, more presentations, more topics, more learning to be had throughout the fall. So just stay tuned on that. So today we are gonna be talking about not just neurons, the brain's other cells with our presenter, Tyra Martinez. And I'm gonna read her bio to you just to remind you um, who is presenting. This was on the flyer, but in case you forget. So Tyra Martinez is a graduate student working towards her master's in biology at the University of Vermont. She is currently conducting 
researching with the Epilepsy, Cognition, and Development Group at UVM. Her research focuses on analyzing functional changes within astrocytes, a type of glial cell, after a seizure and analyzing how these changes can be mitigated in hopes to prevent damage to the brain due to seizures. Um, Tyra completed her bachelor's in neuroscience at UVM in May of 2019. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Tyra to you all. I think this is going to be a fascinating topic today. So welcome, Tyra. We are so glad to Hi, have thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was trying to figure out. Okay, so should I just start? Yep, so you can just share your screens and, and I will monitor the chat box for you and just help you with the polls and all of, of whatever help you need. Um, my screen sharing is disabled. That is, all right, you guys bear with us because I need to make you a co-host. There you go. You're Thank all set you. now. Cool. Okay, so. Perfect, hi. So as Lauren mentioned, my name's Tyra and I'm gonna talk to you about um, the brain's other cells, glial cells. So I'm gonna start first with just a poll to kind of gauge how everyone's feeling, how much you know about the nervous system and the brain. Oh, sorry, I went to the next slide. But. Lauren, I can't hear you. Wow, I was just reading all of that on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Tell me sooner, but that's okay. I, I was reading it for our recording, but luckily it's on the slide and it does look like almost everybody has answered. We're gonna give you about 10 more seconds. Um, and again, this is anonymous, so we don't know what your response was. So don't be shy, answer yeah. the poll. But and if you don't know anything, it. that's perfectly okay. Yeah, so it looks like the majority uh, know that we have nerves and a brain in our body, and I'm going to say that's where I am at too. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, so I'm going to start, and that's good to know because I was going to start with some basic introduction to neuroanatomy and the nervous system. So, so your body has two um, types of nervous systems. You have your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, whereas your peripheral nervous system consists of nerves that tra um, transmit information from the brain and spinal cord to the rest of your body. I'm gonna focus strictly on the central nervous system since I'm focusing majorly on the brain. So within the central nervous system, you have the brain and the brain is broken down into three main components. You have your cerebrum, your cerebellum, and your brainstem. Your cerebrum is this bigger part of the brain, and it is the main control center of the brain and produces thought. Whereas your cerebellum, which is this purple area at the back of the brain, it um, regulates motor control. In particular, it regulates um, muscle movement, balance, um, and those like type of motor controls. And your brainstem also regulates um, motor controls, but it is more for vital involuntary actions, such as your heart beating, breathing, temperature regulation as well. So if we um, look at the cerebrum, it can be broken down into four um, lobes. You have your frontal lobe, your temporal lobe, your parietal lobe, and your occipital lobe. So your frontal lobe um, mostly regulates, regulates cognition and voluntary movements, as well as, as you see in the picture, attention, planning, decision-making, and speech. Your temporal lobe regulates 
um, more sensory information, in particular, specific sensory information such as memory, language, hearing, and, and emotion processing. Um, your parietal lobe um, also regulates sensory information, but it's more in sensory information of stimulation, like feeling someone touching you or tasting something that comes from your parietal lobe. And your occipital lobe regulates your visual processing. Within the cerebrum, there are a myriad of different um, structures, but I wanted to focus on four particular structures that are gonna come up later in this talk. So you have your hippocampus, which is part of your temporal lobe, and it um, regulates memory formation, spatial memory, and navigation. Um, spatial memory is the idea of like remembering where you are walking or remember where you once went and your so the next is your prefrontal cortex which is the um, most front part of your frontal lobe um, and it regulates what we call executive functions so executive functions are specific cognitive behaviors such as emotion attention decision making social awareness those type of things. Your thalamus is part of your brainstem and it sits at the very top part of the brainstem. It's this purple area and it relays sensory and motor information from the body to the brain. And lastly, we have the blood brain barrier. Um, unlike the rest of your body, the, the brain is very particular in what can be um, transmitted from the blood into the brain. So we have this um, huge barrier, they call it the blood-brain barrier, and it protects against toxins and pathogens entering into the brain. And if you look at the rightmost part of my picture, uh, you can see a zoomed in uh, visualization of a blood vessel. And on the left of that picture, you'll see that small molecules are able to pass through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, but larger molecules stay within the bloodstream and don't go into the brain. And so that's part of that protective measure of making sure that large bacteria or viruses do not pass into the brain. But getting more into the brain and how it works, the brain is composed of two main classes of cells. You have neurons and glia cells. Neurons are the main cell type and they're responsible for relaying messages throughout the brain. Glia cells are neuronal support cells. Although that is highlighted in blue because I'm going to challenge that idea. It has been challenged in the last 30 to 40 years and it, I, will, I will speak more on how important glia cells are for the brain. But first, let's talk about neurons. So this is a diagram of a neuron, and I want to go through some of the structural parts of the neuron so you can understand how it works. So first, you have dendrites, which look like these little tree branches. And these dendrites receive and process incoming signals from either um, other neurons or from, ash uh, from glia cells, as well as just any signals that are floating in the fluid in the brain. Once a dendrite receives a neuron and, and the um, cell processes that, excuse me, receives a signal and the cell processes that information, it, it will send additional signals to neighboring cells. So those signals travel down the axon. And if you notice, on this axon, we have these yellow um, oval shapes. That's what we call myelin. So myelin is a protein that encases around an axon, and it's really important for allowing for signals to travel quickly and efficiently. Without myelin, you have um, 
your signals do not travel as fast as they should, and you'll have delays in movement, cognition, etc. cetera. Um, there are certain, like, if you think of multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis is a disorder that occurs because um, neurons in the peripheral nervous system are no longer being myelinated. So the signals are not reaching other um, cells in a timely fashion. And then lastly, once the signal passes along the axon, it reaches this endpoint called the axon terminal. And the axon terminal connects to a target cell to communicate information through a, pro through a process of synaptic transmission, which I'm gonna go into. So I actually have a video, a two minute video that's really good. Also, if anyone's interested, Two Minute Neuroscience is a really great YouTube video or channel. And um, this person is gonna explain synaptic transmission and how neurons signal to other cells. Most communication between neurons occurs in a specialized structure called a synapse. Synapse is an area where two neurons come close enough to one another that they are able to pass chemical signals from one cell to another. The neurons are not actually connected, but are separated by a microscopically small space called the synaptic cleft. The cleft is less than 40 nanometers wide. By comparison, a human hair is about 75,000 nanometers wide. The neuron where the signal is initiated is called the presynaptic neuron, while the neuron that receives the signal is called the postsynaptic neuron. In the presynaptic neuron, there are chemical signals called neurotransmitters that are packaged into small sacs called vesicles. Each vesicle can contain thousands of neurotransmitter molecules. When the presynaptic neuron is excited by an electrical signal called an action potential, this causes the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release their contents into the synaptic cleft. Once they are in the synaptic cleft, neurotransmitters interact with receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. They bind to these receptors and can cause an action to occur in the postsynaptic cell as a result. This action may involve increasing the likelihood that the postsynaptic cell will become activated and fire an action potential or decreasing it. Eventually, the neurotransmitter molecules must be cleared from the synaptic cleft. Some of them will simply drift away in a process called diffusion. In some cases, the neurotransmitter is taken back up into the presynaptic neuron in a process called reuptake. Once back inside the presynaptic neuron, the neurotransmitter can be recycled and reused. In other cases, enzymes break down the neurotransmitter within the synaptic cleft. Then the component parts of the neurotransmitter can be sent back into the presynaptic neuron to make more neurotransmitter. Cool. So I actually got a question throughout the video. Um, so the question was, so in theory, the nervous system is quite similar to an electrical system with input, output, et cetera. And I answered yes. The nervous system um, uses electrical impulses to actually send signals. Um, it's very uh, nuanced and detailed. I'm not going too much into it because the electrical gradient and neurons are pretty detailed. But essentially, yes, there is electrical signals that are helping these neurotransmitters pass through a neuron. And did I have another question? So I'm just gonna go over some of the main topics just so you know what you should focus on from that video in case. So neuron signaling happens in a place called the synapse and it's where two neurons communicate and relay information. Your presynaptic neuron is the neuron that is releasing information such as neurotransmitters from vessels, and your postsynaptic neuron is a neuron that is receiving information through receptors across the space. There are two very important neurotransmitters that I will come up again throughout this um, presentation. You have glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter signal, and when glutamate is um, binds to receptors on a postsynaptic um, neuron, it allows for a, an activity um, signaling to happen. Think of it more of like positive activity happening, um, depending on where you are in the brain. It can mean move a muscle or do, or think that thought. It 
but it is to be thought of as something that allows for positive um, information. Your GABA, on the other hand, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter signal. So it does the opposite when that is um, processed through a neuron. It, it puts a negative signal and wants a neuron to stop doing any activity that it's doing. Okay, so I was gonna do a poll question. You're muted again. Yeah, no, no, I know. I was having trouble getting the uh, correct poll. So the poll has just been launched. Again, if for some reason you can't see it, answer in the chat box. So this time you're gonna be figure, trying to figure out which of these statements is false. So first statement, the cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem are all parts of the brain. The next statement, the order that a signal is sent through a neuron goes dendrite, axon, axon terminal. Uh, third statement, the presynaptic neuron is the neuron that receives information from another neuron via receptors, and the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that releases information to another neuron from vessels. And then you have, there are four main lobes of the brain, the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. And so this is a lot of information. We're going to give you some time to digest each statement and try to figure out which one is false? And if you're unsure, just make a guess. It's anonymous. You won't get penalized for trying. It's not a real test. <laughs> no. We'll give it about another 20 seconds. See if we'll just get a couple more of you to Give it a try. Oh, that's okay. So, Catherine, you can uh, just put your response in the chat if you want. So, I'm going to give it a stop. We have one guessing C and one guessing B in the chat. And it looks like the majority are saying C. How they do? That is correct. C is correct. Um, a couple, uh, the second majority was um, B, so I, I kind of want to go back to this slide and just a reminder that it goes dendrites down past the axon into the axon terminal. But that's okay. Again, Okay, um, before I continue, is there any questions from anyone? Anything to clarify? Okay, oh wait. Uh, nope, we got one. Yes. So why is there a space between synapses in the first place? Okay, that is a very interesting question, a great question actually. So um, the space between synapses um, comes because the brain is surrounded in fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and so in order to allow for neurotransmitters to release or other type of chemicals to release, um, it needs to go through the cerebral spinal fluid. And the reason for that is because neurotransmitters and chemicals that are released from neurons and other cells within the brain are, um, they're, they're pretty tiny and they cause for, I was, as, I was, as I was mentioning before, um, electron gradient changes, so changes in electrical signals throughout the brain. So it's important to have that space so that ions and different electrons also pass when these neurotransmitters pass. Um, there's a lot more to that, but that is the main idea. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to start on 
close the polls. Start on my next topic, which is glia cells. So glia cells were discovered in the 19th century by a host of different scientists. And at the time, glia cells were thought to be solely function as what we called nerve glue. It's actually um, the name neuroglia is stems from neuro meaning neurons and glia meaning glue. <laughs> um, however, as I mentioned, since the 1990s, the idea that glia cells were only there to ensure that the architecture of the brain stayed was challenged. And since then, we've been able to find a lot more evidence of different functions and how important glia cells are for making sure that the brain actually works correctly, rather than just there to keep neurons in place. So um, there are multiple types of glia. I'm going to, again, I'm focusing strictly on the central nervous system. So the four main types of glia within the central nervous system are ependymal cells, which line the ventricles of the brain and produce that cerebral spinal fluid, as I was saying before. Microglia, which are, um, I should actually point, these red cells here. Microglia remove any debris or dead cells from the brain. So they're um, kind of like the brain's garbage trash can removal is how we think of. Astrocytes, which is highlighted in red because that is what I study and research in my own research and what I'm going to focus on when I talk more about um, glia cells, are involved with many different mechanisms. They have many different functions, but they mostly function to regulate homeostasis within the brain. And I'm going to talk about a couple functions and how they do that and making sure that the brain stays balanced. Um, but that is their main function is to maintain homeostasis. And oligodendrocytes are um, glia cells that myelinate neurons in the CNS. And remember I was mentioning myelin wraps around that axon. Um, in this photo, it also shows Schwann cells. So Schwann cells are um, oligodendrocytes of the peripheral nervous system. So they do the same thing just for neurons in the peripheral nervous system they myelinate axons. So, so I wanted to touch a little bit on um, the timeline of glia cells because I've been mentioning that we've been able to understand glia cells better in the last couple decades. Um, and when I say that, a lot of people kind of have this idea that glia cells were only discovered in the last couple decades. But in actuality, glia cells were discovered around the same time that neurons were discovered. So this is just a quick timeline of the different like um, scientists and when different um, glia cells were first discovered. And so around the 1850s was when we first started being able to see glia cells and actually visualize glia cells and scientists were describing them and drawing them in their own research. Similarly, around the 1850s were the first neurons were actually first being saw and described and drawn by scientists. So if you also notice, Camilio Golgi, Santiago Ramon Cajal are some of the same uh, researchers that discovered glia cells. So they were discovering these at the same time and drawing them. But functionality, at the time, we didn't have the proper um, technology to really notice the function of glia cells until the 1990s. Cool. So now I'm going to get into astrocytes. I'm going to predominantly, my talk is going to be on astrocytes. And so astrocytes are these glia cells that I mentioned before. They keep homeostasis in the brain. They present with this star-like figure, and this bottom figure is actually like um, an image from a microscope of an astrocyte, um, and it was stained and colorized. But yeah, so they present with the star-like figure, which is how they got their name. 
Astrocytes are also the most abundant glia cell in the brain. And as, as I keep mentioning, homeostasis. And some of the ways that they um, function as, for homeostasis are regulating metabolism, blood flow, neurotransmission, as well as helping microglia protect, from, protect the brain from injury. I'm gonna go into depth into each of those topics and how they actually um, work on a mechanism. And the last thing I wanted to say about astrocytes to keep in mind is that there are two types of astrocytes and two subtypes, and um, that'll become important a little bit later. So, as I kind of mentioned, Santiago Ramon Cajal is um, a researcher in the 1850s, and he has been often coined and considered the founder of modern neuroscience. He's one of the first um, scientists, along with his partner, Camilo Golgi, to actually produce physical images of neurons and astrocytes. Um, in the past, when I mentioned that describing and illustrating, it was more scientists saw these cells and were drawing them, but so Santiago Ramon Cajal actually was able to take images and stain astrocytes. And these photos are actually some of his original images of astrocytes that were found in the 1850s. So I'm gonna quickly go into like structure of astrocytes so you can understand how they are similar but different um, to neurons. So similarly with neurons, they have a cell body and a soma and everything. But unlike neurons, they don't have axons or axon terminals in order to um, communicate with other cells, but they are able to communicate with neurons, astrocytes, and other glia cells. And how they're able to do that is that they have these things called astrocytic extensions, also called astrocytic end feet. And so these astrocytic end feet have receptors on them and, and transporters on them so that they can communicate with other cells within the brain. And so, as I mentioned, there are two types of astrocytes. So we have type one, and they're called A1 astrocytes, and they're found in the gray matter of the brain. They are um, the most abundant in high synaptic activity areas, which means that they are the most abundant in areas where there are high levels of complex thought and, and neurotransmitters um, being passed, like cognition and behavior. And their functions include formation and clearancing of synapses. So they, um, synapses can be destroyed or created. Um, it's the idea that your brain is constantly evolving and growing. It doesn't just stop. So when you learn new things or you want to forget things, you have synapses that develop or get removed. They also function for the clearance of glutamate, which I mentioned was an excitatory signal in neurotransmitter. They regulate blood flow in response to synapse activity. And lastly, they proliferate, which means that they um, divide and constantly like creating more in a response to injury and become what we call reactive astrocytes. And I will get into more about reactive astrocytes um, a little later. And the type two um, astrocytes are found in the white matter. Um, and their functions are not really that clear, but they have been shown to also be in contact with blood vessels. Um, so there's less research done on type two astrocytes. Okay, so here's another poll. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna launch our third poll. There's a couple of true or false. So for each statement, decide true or false. First statement, glia cells were only discovered 30 years ago. True or false. Second statement, astrocytes have axon terminals that allow them to communicate with neurons at the synapse. 
true or false. And your third statement is astrocytes are the most abundant glia cell. True or false? So you can go answer all, oh, it would help if I launched it. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, it's very hot in my house today. So I'm just like, <laughs> I think I'm having just a slow brain hand misconnection. <laughs> So good, I see you all are putting in your responses. We'll give it about another 30 seconds, let you guys make your choices. Make sure to hit done after you've answered all three so it registers. All right, is anybody else gonna submit their poll? Gonna, gonna close it. And Tyra, you can tell them were they right or wrong. Um, majority was right in all three questions. So glia cells, as mentioned, were not discovered 30 years ago. They were discovered in the 1850s along with neurons. Astrocytes um, do not have axon terminals. They have astrocytic end feet that allow them to communicate with neurons at the synapse. And astrocytes are the most abundant glia cells. Are there any questions before I move on? I don't see any in the Q&A just yet. You guys can enter your questions at any time and we'll keep checking to see if, if you have any questions. Yeah, I'll probably um, answer questions at, at every poll stop so that, cause it's a good breaking point, just yes. so you know. All righty. So without much further ado, I'm gonna go into the four astrocytic functions that help maintain brain homeostasis. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is neuronal energy, which I mentioned in the past is this metabolism part of astrocytic functions. So neurons use ATP for energy and they get ATP from glucose tra um, um, traveled from the blood. And glucose is a sugar and they break down glucose into ATP. Astrocytes also receive glucose from the blood. However, astrocytes don't convert glucose into ATP. Instead, they convert glucose into a complex sugar called glycogen, and they store glycogen. Now, when someone has low blood sugar levels, there is not enough oxygen that are going to the neurons, and when you don't have enough oxygen, you can't break down um, you can't produce um, things to make ATP, and you also don't have levels of glucose in the blood that is being transferred into neurons because low blood sugar levels. So in these cases, astrocytes release glycogen into the neurons, and the neurons use um, the glycogen from astrocytes to make ATP. So as far as maintaining neuronal health and metabolism, Astrocytes are really important because they store um, the necessary sugars, um, these complex sugars, for times when neurons do not have um, normal blood sugar levels. And this is something that's important. If you think of someone who is diabetic, their blood sugar levels constantly fluctuate. So if they weren't able to have a storage or have astrocytes giving um, storing glycogen, then they'll have more neuronal death because there'd be nowhere for the neurons to actually um, create sugars and make ATP. The second function is the is brain blood flow. So as I mentioned before, the blood-brain barrier covers the entire brain, and it's very crucial to make sure that certain things are not being passed from the bloodstream into the brain. Um, astrocytes have, as I mentioned, end feet that wrap around cerebral blood vessels and capillaries. The brain is pretty sensitive to changes in blood flow and 
um, it's important that blood flow doesn't change too often because the brain receives oxygen and energy from the blood. So it needs a consistent amount of blood flow. So astrocytes make sure that the brain is um, constantly being supplied by blood and also making sure that certain areas of the brain are getting enough blood. So in areas where there are complex actions such as thinking or cognitive behaviors, um, there needs to be a higher amount of blood flow to supply enough energy to, cog to cognitively think. So the astrocytes will constrict and dilate capillaries and vessels to make sure that those areas are getting the most amount of blood flow at those times. It's also really important to have astrocytes regulating blood flow because astrocytes are able to maintain blood flow to the brain when changes in blood pressure occur. So I don't know if you've ever heard this, but like in movies and stuff, if someone like has a heart attack or passes out, they'll say that you have four minutes before you start having damage to the brain. And that's because during that time, even though your heart's not pumping and you're not getting blood pressure, astrocytes are regulating the blood that's already there to maintain the fact that the brain can still function. So the other, the third way is astrocyte, um, astrocyte functions for neurotransmission. So I've kind of mentioned these two neurotransmitters, GABA and glutamate. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the synaptic space and everything like that. One of the things about neurotransmitter emission is that it, the brain works in a very delicate balance. You need to have um, a balance of glutamate being um, expressed and as well as a balance of GABA. So astrocytes have transporters on them to allow for the clearance of neurotransmitters from the synaptic space. So if you have too much glutamate, it can cause for um, this um, thing called excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity means that a neuron is being overly stimulated with excitatory signals, and that can lead to neuronal death or um, disease models with too much glutamate neurons are sending off are getting way too many excitatory signals and that dysregulates neuronal functions. Similarly, if you have too much GABA, then you can have a, a um, overly inhib inhibition um, state and neurons are not getting enough excitatory signals and it can cause for um, defects in cognition and in motor because these neurons are not able to send the proper signals to function. Um, so it's really important that astrocytes have these transporters on them so that they can make sure that they clear any excess neurotransmitters from the synaptic space and maintain a balance with neuronal signaling. And lastly, astrocytes in the immune response. So mentioned, as I mentioned before, there are two types of astrocytes. A1 astrocytes are um, the most, um, most research astrocytes. And one of the um, ways that A1 astrocytes are really interesting is that A1 astrocytes become reactive. They get activated in response to any type of brain injury. And when they become reactive, they work with other glia cells like microglia to remove any toxic substances from an injury site. And they also release neuroprotective um, signals to try and maintain, um, maintain neurons and mitigate any more neuronal death. However, reactive astrocytes undergo a, undergo a spectrum of changes. And some of these changes can be reversible and some of them cannot. And the reason why this is so um, heavily researched is because while reactive astrocytes can be very helpful, they've also been contributed to many different um, neurological disorders and diseases. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little later, but I first I just wanna show you the spectrum of how um, reactive astrocytes work and what can change. 
So on this image, you have a, um, it's a gradient from healthy astrocytes all the way down to really detrimental astrocytes that are reactive and cause um, severe problems. So when astrocytes become reactive, one of the um, things that can change is the structure of the astrocyte changes. So um, it just, once it becomes reactive, the different types of signals and receptors and transporters on the astrocyte change. Secondly, astrocyte functions be become changed when they're reactive. Um, sometimes it's mild, but sometimes it can be more severe where astrocytes functionality are completely dysregulated and they are no longer able to pr um, produce mechanisms to maintain homeostasis in the brain. In more moderate to severe reactive astrocyte functions, you'll have multiple astrocytes performing the same job. So it will occur that many astrocytes will come to the site of injury trying to protect the brain from injury and it leaves for areas where astrocytes are needed to protect neurons in other parts of the brains empty because astrocytes are migrating to the injury to try and protect the brain. And lastly, what is constantly reviewed in literature for um, disease models and disorders is astrocytes that become really reactive and cause for neuronal inflammation and scar formation. Um, there's a thing called a glial scar, which occurs when you have a lot of reactive astrocytes pro proliferating in a um, area and it causes for inflammation and inflammation of the astrocytes. And sometimes inflammation can cause for tissue death and neuron death. However, inflammation is not always bad. And sometimes there are practical implications of reactive astrocytes becoming inflammatory and having such a severe response. And for example, which stroke? When someone has a stroke, astrocytes, reactive astrocytes will go to the site of injury and provide metabolic support to neurons. And studies have shown that when you, when you um, don't have reactive astrocytes coming at the site of a stroke, then their neurons around the stroke area will continue to die and neighboring neurons will also continue to die. Studies have also shown that if you try to prevent the inflammation and scar formation of astrocytes during a stroke, it, it causes for breakage of the blood-brain barrier. So some of that inflammation is actually helping the blood from continuously to leak throughout the brain. And lastly, it's important for some clinical aspects. Um, when physicians are looking at the brain and trying to determine like when a stroke occurred and where, astrocytic inflammation is really helpful for physicians to see exactly where the stroke is occurring and understand based off of how much inflammation is there, how long the stroke happened, like how long before the patient came in that, is, that the stroke occurred. So that was a lot of information. So here's my next poll. Okay, so I am launching the next poll and you're being asked what are the four main functions of astrocytes? Is it they store complex sugars to supply ATP to neurons when blood sugar levels are low? They control low flow to ensure the brain is always receiving adequate amounts of blood to function. That's supposed they, to be blood flow, sorry. Okay. They regulate neurotransmitter levels by either releasing necessary neurotransmitters or clearing excess neurotransmitters from the synaptic space. They respond to neuronal injury and work with other glia cells uh, pr to protect the brain and remove toxic substances or all of the above. We'll give you guys a minute to respond. It looks like the majority are saying all of the above. Which is right. I think this was definitely my easiest question. <laughs> um, Yes, I just wanted to stress this because 
astrocytes are super important to the brain. And as you can see, like without astrocytes, you really couldn't function as a person. And um, it they're not just neuron glue as before thought. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions? I know I gave a lot of information right there, so I wanna make sure everyone understands everything. Yeah, I don't see anything in the Q&A yet. Just a reminder, you guys can add your questions at any time and there is no question that is not worth asking. So if you're kind of just thinking like, oh, I'm not really sure, just put it in there because I guarantee you someone else will appreciate that question. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna move on. And, oh, this was a summary slide just to kind of remind you, I mean, we went over it again, but if you ever wanted to look back, this is a good slide to just show you all the different ways. Oh, there is a question now. Why is this face, uh, that was last time. So Lily's asking, when you get a concussion, what does it do to your brain? Great question. So a concussion, concussions are often undervalued. Um, they do a lot of damage actually. Um, so what happens when you get a concussion, you immediately get inflammation from that, that injury site. Um, that's due to astrocytes being reactive as well as neuron death. Um, you all, that inflammation can also um, cause for uh, the brain tissue to press against blood vessels and capillaries in the brain, which can cause for a lack of blood flow. Um, and also uh, concussions, because when, neuro, when neurons die due to injury, they don't um, apoptose. I believe some of you know that. They go under a different um, process of dying called necrosis, which means that they kind of like explode and release a bunch of chemicals and neurotransmitters into the synaptic space and across the like fluid of the brain. So you also have um, upregulation of chemicals that shouldn't be there. And if a concussion is really bad or you continuously get concussions, um, you can cause uh, detrimental damage to your neurons and cause for complete like developmental changes in neighboring neurons. Um, if you think about uh, the whole thing about TBIs and concussions that are coming up with football and everything like that, it's because these constant concussions are causing for neighboring neurons that weren't affected to be affected. So, yeah. Oh, we are getting a couple more questions. Um, will we be able to view this slideshow after the meeting? So I do record all sessions and the recording will be available um, to you all. Yeah, and I put my contact information at the very last slide. So if you really want it, I can email you the slideshow. And then Lily is following up. So is it still the same for a mild concussion? Can neurons grow back? Very good question. So. Um, Yes and no. I want to say mild concussions are not the same as severe concussions. It's kind of like that spectrum that I showed with reactive astrocytes. You, depending on the severity of a concussion, it there is less amount of neuron death, there is less amount of inflammation, everything is less severe because it's not a severe concussion. However, um, people tend to think that mild concussions mean that you don't have any symptoms, and that's not true. Any Concu concussion can cause symptoms. You can have just one concussion and it can cause for symptoms later on. Um, so I don't want to say that mild concussions completely revert, but they are less severe than severe concussions and they have less um, long lasting effects. Um, and as far as neurons growing back, yes. So um, it's kind of been thought for a very long time, uh, I would say up until like end of the 90s, early 2000s, that you might have heard your brain cells never grow back, like they just die. 
And neuroregeneration is an up and coming topic in research. And there is some evidence that neurons can grow back and that you can, um, and that you can rebuild in the um, CNS and in the PNS. However, it is very difficult and there isn't a lot of like research on how to treat to start that process. So it's still something that's being very researched, but I wouldn't say that you couldn't regrow a neuron because that's not true, you can, but it is a very difficult process. Okay, great. Those are some great questions, everyone. All right, so I'm gonna get into um, a couple of neurodegenerative disorders and how astrocytes play an important role. Okay. You're welcome, Lily. Um, and the two disorders that I'm gonna to touch on are Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So Alzheimer's is something that probably all of you have heard of. And um, it causes for memory delay as well as cognition um, dysfunction. So one of the key characteristics of Alzheimer's is um, an accumulation of amyloid beta plaques. Amyloid beta plaques are um, a protein that is released throughout the brain and during normal balances and like checks and balances, amyloid beta is fine. However, when you have Aggravated amyloid beta proliferation, um, it can cause for disrupted blood flow and neurotoxic factors. And I, I wanna say also just about amyloid beta. So when you sleep, astrocytes clear amyloid beta from your um, extracellular space. So usually you have a set amount of amyloid beta that you use throughout the day and then any extra gets cleared out during your sleep cycle. Um, however, as mentioned with Alzheimer's, amyloid beta, beta plaques are growing at an excessive rate. And during the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, astrocytes are actually really good at controlling these amyloid beta um, growth to like prevent plaques. But as the disease progresses, um, the plaques are growing um, at a rate that is uncontrollable by astrocytes. And unfortunately, when you continue to have amyloid beta plaques growing, there is a release of signals to cause for more astrocytes to become reactive. And that will eventually lead to detrimental amounts of inflammation in the brain. So it's kind of a, a two-part thing. Um, astrocytes are reacting because they, they understand that this excess amount of amyloid beta will cause for problems, but once it becomes aggressive, the amount of astrocytes reacting is actually um, increasing the progression of the, dis the disease because it is causing for more inflammation throughout the brain. And when, and lastly, when that also happens, it, when these astrocytes are becoming super reactive and causing for inflammation, their functionality is being um, dysregulated. So astrocytes are proliferating and trying to stop amyloid beta plaques and they're not paying attention or focusing on maintaining um, uh, homeostasis in the brain. So it also causes for neuronal death because there is not astrocytes there helping with metabolism and neurotransmission. So Parkinson's, on the other hand, um, has a little bit of a different um, relationship with astrocytes. So Parkinson's occurs from neuronal death in the substantial Niagara. Um, the substantial Niagara is a part of your brainstem and it, it's important for releasing um, uh, certain neurotransmitters to the brain to allow for motor functions. 
and one of those neurotransmitters is dopamine. So Parkinson's occurs when there is neuronal death in the substantia Niagara, and there, that causes for a lack of dopamine release throughout the brain. Um, there are a lot of different ways that people can get Parkinson's, but one way is um, there are many like different genetic mutations that have been shown in research to um, be a, a factor or a causing factor of Parkinson's. And when looking at these genetic mutations, they've seen that astrocytes become disrupted due to these genetic mutations. So um, in the picture on the left, it shows like reactive astrocytes in Parkinson's and it kind of highlights onto the right a specific image of a synapse. So in the purple, you have astrocytes in the green, you have um, microglia, and that part that's like really red is a neuron. And what happens when you have reactive astrocytes occurring in the substantial Niagara, usually due to genetic mutations, um, there is a two part. Your astrocytes become pro inflammatory and allow for neuronal death and neuroinflammation, as well as there is a loss of function of a, ah, accumulation to get rid of alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein is a protein that is within um, the brain. And when there are high levels of alpha synuclein, it causes for neuron death. So astrocytes and microglia um, clear levels of alpha signaling, but when astrocytes become mutated and reactive in um, Parkinson's related um, gene mutations, they are no longer released, they're no longer um, eliminating that alpha signaline. And that then becomes upregulated into the neurons and cause for the neurons to die, as well as inflammation from the reactive astrocytes cause for neurons to die. And um, once these neurons die in the substantial Niagara, you have a lack of dopamine and it's kind of a cycle of what happens. I see there's a chat, I just wanna... Okay, I will go a little faster, cool. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about astrocytes and epilepsy, which is the main part of my research. And um, from the schematic, you can see that there are many different ways that astrocytes are um, impacted within epileptic models. I'm gonna to touch on about three specific ways, talking about glutamate, GABA, and inflammation. So epilepsy is characterized by unprovoked and spontaneous seizure activity. Um, in many cases, the cause is unknown, but as, as you see here, there are many different factors that can contribute to epilepsy. And there are many different models of epilepsy. I'm gonna talk about three specific models. The first model is temporal lobe epilepsy. Temporal lobe ep epilepsy is the most common form of epilepsy, and from the name, you can um, guess that it occurs in the temporal lobe. Um, these seizures usually last from anywhere to 30 seconds to a couple minutes, and a lot of people tend to um, uh, recall that they had what we call an aura. You might have heard that before, where they have a taste or a smell of something that causes them to know that a seizure is coming, which makes sense because the temporal lobe, as I mentioned before, um, regulates certain sensory like hearing and smell and those things. And as shown, there's a variety of symptoms. You can lose language. Again, your temporal lobe does language, um, does language and um, processing motor activity and usually confuse mostly because they just had a seizure. Um, so with temporal lobe epilepsy, there is an ex an excess amount of glutamate that is occurring in the synapse, which and I mentioned causes excitotoxicity. And excitotoxicity can lead to seizure activity 
So what's happening is astrocytes have glutamate transporters, which are used to um, get rid of glutamate from a synaptic space, and metabolic glutamate receptors, which are used to release um, glutamate into the synaptic space when needed. Um, but during temporal lobe epilepsy, there is a dysregulation of the transporters and receptors. So there is a decreased activity of glutamate transporters and an increased activity of metabolic glutamate receptors, um, which means that basically glutamate's no um, astrocytes are no longer removing glutamate and instead they are actually increasing the amount of glutamate that is occurring. Um, and when this happens, the astrocyte is then completely dysregulated and it leads to also not only like seizure activity, but can lead to dysregulation of neighboring astrocytes and neighboring neurons, which allow for there to be an increased susceptibility to seizure activity. So yeah. Obstance and epilepsy is a very unique type of epilepsy. It occurs in early childhood and for around ages four to eight. And for a lot of people, um, obstance who have obstance epilepsy, they, um, they outgrow it by the time they're in um, late childhood or early adolescence. Um, the reason why they're so um, unique is because unlike in what you think of a seizure where someone is getting convulsing, convulsing, which is shaking or getting really rigid, rigid in their muscles, obstinate epilepsies do not have any type of convulsion or rigidity when they seize. Instead, you'll see children staring off and becoming unresponsive and a lot of the way that you can tell that they're having a seizure is usually just rapid eye rolling and blinking. And these seizures are very short, they don't last too long, and usually the children are not aware that they're occurring. Um, and I mentioned here, because I'm gonna talk about it in the next slide, is to note that opson epilepsies occur in the thalamus. So these seizures are occurring within the thalamus. And so why that's important is because the majority of GABA transporters in the thalamus are on astrocytes. And what happens in seizures like opson epilepsy is that you have a dysregulation of astrocytes, which cause for a um, dysregulation of GABA transporters. GABA transporters, like glutamate transporters, take GABA outside of, like remove GABA from the synaptic space. So when that doesn't happen, you have a tonic GABA release, meaning there's constant GABA being released across the synaptic space. And it leads to this kind of paradox. Um, you would think with excess amount of GABA inhibition, you couldn't have an excitatory um, signal which, to cause a seizure. But in fact, when you have a tonic GABA release, it allows for excitatory signals to occur more frequently. And it's thought to be through this process of disinhibition. So if you look at the bottom, uh, those think of those as like neurons. If you have neurons sending inhibitory responses to neurons and that starts happening on a global level, eventually these inhibitory neuro, like inhibitory signals are going to inhibit neurons from sending other inhibitory signals to neighboring neurons that need to stop their excitable activity. And so it causes for disinhibition. So if you look at the schematic, that second um, neuron, you would want to actually give it a excitatory signal so that it knows, okay, yes, yeah, send this inhibition signal to this neighboring neuron. But if it's getting an inhibition signal, it's not gonna send an inhibition to the third neuron. And so that neuron is just gonna keep accumulating excitatory signals, which can lead to a seizure. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about post-traumatic epilepsy. We talked a little bit before in your question, Lily, about TBIs and concussions. So post-traumatic epilepsy is um, 
a specific epilepsy that occurs due to a neuronal in injury, so like a traumatic brain injury or a severe, such as a stroke, you hit your head really hard, anything like that. And what happens is once you've had that injury, some people develop seizures within a couple weeks and then continue to develop seizures um, throughout the first two years post-injury. Um, and in this schematic, you'll see that once the first seizure happens due to the injury site, you'll have excess glutamate being released, which will cause for, if you see the NLP and all that, those are just um, inflammatory signals to allow for neuroinflammation. So it's gonna cause for neuroinflammation to occur, as well as when the seizures occur, they make um, astrocytes reactive, which also release um, certain energy signals to cause for neuroinflammation. And once you have an excess amount of neuroinflammation occurring due to these seizures, it can lead to an epile to epilepsy and, and gaining post-traumatic epilepsy. So I have two poll questions coming up. Um, they're back to back. They're pretty quick. All right, so the first one is being launched. In what disorder are reactive astrocytes effective during the beginning stages, but become more detrimental during the later stages? Parkinson's, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, or stroke? This one is a little hard, so. I definitely think this is my hardest question. So again, this isn't a test. Give it a try. See what yeah. you think. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for hanging in. I know we're running long today, ah, but sorry. it's fascinating. And I know Tyra is getting towards the end of her presentation. So hopefully yep. you can all just stick around just a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm just going into a couple slides on my research and that's it. Great. And it looks like... Right now, it looks like Alzheimer is taking the lead. So we'll stop the poll there. How'd they do? Alzheimer's is correct. Um, for stroke, it's actually really helpful um, for reactive astrocytes. Um, I can understand why you want epilepsy. I think that was a little hard of me to put that because it does consistently cause for epilepsy to get worse and more susceptible. So I, I'm gonna, I'm actually, I'm faulting myself with this question. Epilepsy is also a, a good idea. And the last question I have is this one where um, I went through all these epilepsies, three particular ones, and I just wanna see if you remember what mechanism of astrocytes affect these types of epilepsies. Or epilepsy. So you're gonna match um, so the first one is the temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, astrocytes stop being able to clear glutamate. Astrocytes stop being able to clear GABA or high levels of inflammation induced by astrocytes. The next is post-traumatic epilepsy. Astrocytes stop being able to clear glutamate. Astrocytes stop being able to clear GABA or high levels of inflammation induced by astrocytes. The last being uh, is it absence? Is that how you it's, pronounce it? Yeah, it's supposed to be French absence. Absence, epilepsy. So again, your three choices, astrocytes stop being able to clear glutamate, astrocytes stop being able to clear GABA, or high levels of inflammation induced by astrocytes. So try to match uh, the model of epilepsy with the effect it has. Again, you know, give it a try if, if you're not sure we don't know who's putting what. See if you can get it right. And if not, you're still gonna learn something. We're looking really good. Um, I'm seeing majority correct in all of these questions. So far, I will give a couple more people. Although yeah, I... let, let a few more give it a try. We'll share the results after and you can tell everyone what the correct answer is. Yep. Also, thank you for everyone who's still here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. And we do record, so we get, we get people who watch these recordings at a later date, so it will be awesome to have this as a resource. So I'm going to share the results. So how'd these guys do? What's the correct answer? For temporal lobe ep epilepsy, astrocytes stop being able to clear glutamate. 
So that is correct. For post-traumatic epilepsy, it is high levels of inflammation induced by astrocytes, this neuroinflammation, as I saw, as I showed in that graph. And for opson epilepsy, it's a little hard to wrap your brain around. It's kind of a weird one, but it is um, astrocytes stop being able to clear GABA. Um, it's very hard because it's kind of like a paradox, like GABA is causing for excitatory signals. So I understand the confusion. Yeah, hey, I'm gonna- Kyra, quickly... I'm gonna throw up one last poll because I know we're gonna lose a couple people. Mm -hmm. And I always, um, I always have to wrap up with a feedback poll. So I'm gonna ask you guys to just quickly do our feedback poll before we learn about Tyra's uh, final like research. So if you guys can just answer these two quick questions um then we can move on to her research but it's always just really important that we get these questions answered as well just so i'm going to try to get a couple more of you to respond if you want i cannot look at it while you guys respond so you feel better if you want to give me all right anyone else All right, I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you guys for doing that. And we'll go to the final slides. Yeah, so I'm gonna quickly go through my own research. So I study early life seizures. Early life seizures um, are pretty important because they develop during important developmental stages. Um, and what happens are like these seizures occur during early childhood and throughout adolescence and um, even further. But when that happens, uh, you, it can cause for a lot of neuronal injury, changes to neural, neuron development, as well as cognitive impairments, which is a huge, um, I, I would say a lot of people who have these seizures are very um, upset about the lack of cognition or development. I don't know how to explain that. But, um, and what happens is that you have an increased amount of glutamate expression and an increased amount of astrocyte inflammation. So astrocytes, I haven't gone into it too much, but these are some of the other ways. Astrocytes are really important for cognition. They help with memory consolidation and um, also with learning and making sure you remember what you're learning. Um, and when you have dysfunction to astrocytes, you'll get network imbalances and cognitive impairment. And studies have shown that abnormal astrocyte signaling can lead to cognitive impairments in Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. So it's really important that astrocytes are functioning well to allow for the brain to um, continue to learn, grow, and um, retain information. So ACTH is a hormone that is released by the pituitary gland. It, um, the pituitary gland is a part of your brain that releases a bunch of hormones and steroids due to um, different like actions or stress. Um, it is also a neuropeptide, which means that it is a hormone that is able to be um, released and expressed and as well as upregulated by neurons. And as I mentioned, ACTH is released during stress. However, it also has been shown to have neuroprotective effects when released on cognition. And why this is really important for my research is that ACTH is also able to be um, uptake by not just neurons, but also glia cells, in particular, astrocytes. Um, when looking at preclinical studies and also human trial studies, um, there's been a lot of research to show that ACTH has improved cognitive behaviors in patients with Alzheimer's and patients um, who have suffered a stroke. Um, in preclinical studies, you've seen that ACTH has been able to mitigate anxiety levels, fear levels, as well as improving short-term memory loss. And lastly, ACTH is actually used as a treatment for infantile spasms, which are um, similar to epilepsy. If they, unlike epilepsy, infantile spasms happen at an infant age and um, the seizures are use, usually really short. But that's really important because um, at that infantile age, 
your brain is developing rapidly. So ACTH has been shown to actually protect the brain from cognitive decline in infantile spasms and has been used as a treatment. Um, so I say all this to say for my project, um, I've been researching and my hypothesis is that early life seizures will cause for a dysregulation of astrocytes and lead to reactive astrocytes and that ACTH treatments can reduce astrocyte dysregulation and prevent the negative effects of reactive astrocytes. So that's what I've been studying, that's what I've been looking at, and hopefully I can find a good correlation to that. Thank you to everyone who came, asked brilliant questions. Um, I have my contact information. If you didn't get a chance to ask me a question, you can email me a question. If you want these slides, I can email them to you. That's fantastic. I will say um, it's not a question, but someone put in the Q&A box, great presentation. So thank you. Whoever wrote that because it was done anonymously. Thank you. It's always, I know when I present, it's always nice to hear that someone enjoyed the presentation. So yeah, yeah that was a lot of information. I'm hoping, oh, there are some, another question. Good one, Lily. Um, how many years were you in school and what made you do this job? That's a great question. Yeah, so I, um, I did my four-year undergrad at UVM. I um, finished uh, in 2019. I graduated in May of 2019. Um, why I took this job, I'm a master's student, so this is part of my thesis, but why I took this job, I came into UVM really interested in the brain, and they had a neuroscience um, degree, so I took neuroscience. And I was kind of interested beforehand in like autism, but I took a class with my PI as a guest lecturer. PI yeah, means principal investigator. She's the one who, um, she's basically my boss. Um, and she did a guest lecture on epilepsy and I was really interested. And so I asked to do some volunteering in her lab and throughout my undergrad. And I just became more and more interested into epilepsy and understanding how it works and then learning more about what glia cells were i'd never even heard of them until like my junior year of college and so throughout the entire process of my undergrad i became extremely interested in neuroscience extremely interested in epilepsy and here i am and you know tyra that just reminded me so for those of you still in high school who think you know studying the brain maybe going neuroscience route in college um, we did a really interesting um, quarantine time in early June on the Vermont Brain Bee. Are you familiar with the Vermont Brain Bee, Tyra? Yeah, I've actually and, heard of it. Oh, that's great. So it is a program that um, you all in high school can get involved with. And it's a great way to sort of begin your education within the brain and within neuroscience. If you're interested in that, I would encourage you, there's a recording on that session on the 4-H website that you guys always go to to register for stuff. And you can watch that. And I know that they're really looking to grow the program and get into more locations, um, more schools around the state. So I would encourage all of you guys to check out the Vermont Brain Bee and that recording that we have to learn about it. Yeah. I also agree. <laughs> yeah. So I will say I don't see any other questions at this time. I would though encourage you guys if, if a question does come up, you know, Tara gave you her email. I'm sorry, Tyra. Yeah. Um, I, okay. work, I, I have Tara. someone that's in the office usually next to mine called Tara. So it's a slip. But I would encourage you all to uh, use Tyra as a resource if questions do come up. And um, thank you all for joining us today, sticking around, um, you know, going a little long today, but it was well worth it. And I hope to see you all next week. So thank you guys. And Tyra, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you. I'm glad, I thank you all for being such active participants. I really appreciate it and I'm glad I could share.